Hello and welcome to a lecture on the July Crisis and historiography of the First World War. This um, first part will only focus on the July Crisis, there will be a follow-up lecture, online lecture on historiography. Okay, the July Crisis as has already been uh, mentioned in a previous lesson where you examined a chronology, both long-term and short-term, of events leading up to World War One. The July Crisis is the short-term cause of the First World War. And the dates that we will examine when we talk about this July Crisis actually begin in June and end in August. We're looking at the 20th of June through until the 6th of August 1914. Now the main question that we're going to consider here is who is to blame for the outbreak of the First World War? We have examined the long-term factors that might explain that perhaps Germany was responsible for the outbreak of war because of a more aggressive um, foreign policy from roughly 1890 onwards. Or perhaps Germany felt she had to go to war in 1914 not for aggressive um, reasons but for defensive reasons because she had been unfairly encircled by other European powers. These long-term factors are very important, but historians also need to focus on the short-term factors that explain exactly why war breaks out in 1914. Long-term factors are useful in terms of maybe explaining why certain parties acted in a certain way in this July crisis. But the July crisis itself is complicated and throws up a number of issues that we're going to explore that could have resulted in war, perhaps not taking place. So the long-term um, factors didn't necessarily have to lead to war. Okay, we will come back to this uh, Germany declares war in a second. Okay, the class that I'm going to, um, or this lesson I'm going to focus on, um, it's mainly going to focus on Germany because Germany have, have been our um, kind of country of choice to examine the events that lead to World War I. But the nature of the assessment that you have to do, whether it be an essay or a presentation, you have to look at contrasting views. So we've looked at contrasting views in terms of who is to blame for World War I from the long term perspective both Germany and Weltpolitik or other powers and encirclement of Germany. And now we're going to look at a similar argument with the, the short term. Now, there are historians that we will encounter in a future lesson, right, when we study the historiography. Uh, one historian called John Rawl, who argues that Germany were to blame for the outbreak of World War I and German actions during the July crisis support the view that Germany was to blame. You're going to watch a documentary um, video at the end of this lesson. The historians that you will encounter in this documentary, Max Hastings, Hugh Strawn, Anika Mombauer, and also John Wall, they all take the view that Germany is mostly to blame for events during the July crisis, and it's Germany who pushes for war. But there is an alternative historical interpretation, sometimes referred to as collective responsibility, that blames all of Europe's major powers, and some of the minor powers if we include Serbia as well. And therefore it's unfair to blame Germany for the outbreak of war during the July crisis alone. One such historian is Christopher Clark, and you will get an opportunity to hear and read some of Clark's work in a future lesson. In this short presentation, we will look at two key pieces of evidence primary source evidence that you will have to apply in your assessment, whether it be a presentation or an essay. One of these pieces of evidence will argue that maybe Germany was to blame, the other piece of evidence may lay the blame more so at Russia. So when you are answering a question who was to blame for the outbreak of World War I from a short term perspective, from the 1914 July crisis perspective, there might be some evidence that points to uh, Germany, there might be some evidence that points to um, Russia. There may be also evidence that points to Serbia and to Austria Hungary. The site of the event that sparks World War One 
is in the Balkans. Now I've already made some reference to the Balkans, you've already looked at some online um, maps of this part of Europe, very complicated part of Europe, lots of countries in 1912-1913 um, we have less countries in this part of the world than we do now, right? The Balkan region um, has um, basically split into um, seven different um, countries, some of which are disputed, um, since the wars in Yugoslavia in the late 19, um, or mid-1990s into the early 2000s. We are interested in here really just in um, three areas. Um, the site, that place where the war, you could argue, begins because of the event that takes place is in what is now Bosnia-Herzegovina. Bosnia, as you know, was independent until 1908. Then it was annexed by this country, Austria-Hungary. Hence why all of this colour here, the light blue, um, is uh, over Bosnia and Austria. This is the, the Habsburg Empire. So Sarajevo is in Bosnia, but it's at this point controlled by Austria-Hungary. The European power that would quite like control over Bosnia, because there's a large Serbian population within Bosnia-Herzegovina, is Serbia. And here's the capital of Serbia, Belgrade. The Serbs are going to be accused of starting the, um, the process of World War I by sponsoring either terrorists or freedom fighters to assassinate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which we'll look at in a second, in Sarajevo in uh, June 1914. Serbia, if they were guilty, therefore has to take some responsibility for the outbreak of the war. There's one final country in the Balkan region, just part of this country is in the Balkan region, and that is Russia, who you can see here. Russia had great influence over many of these uh, Balkan um, nations, especially Bulgaria. And Russia saw itself as being the protector of Slavonic nations, and that would include Bulgarians and, and Serbians and Montenegrins and so on and so forth. Therefore, Russia would, in 1914, have a critical say in how events would develop after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. From this map here, there is no Germany on the scene, there's no France, there's no Britain, and for the British in particular there was a real sense that what was going on within the Balkans had absolutely nothing to do with Britain or British foreign policy which primarily focused on Britain's overseas empire in Africa and Asia. So let's get to the timeline of events that explains what happens in most of the month of July that eventually leads to war at the start of August 1914. As you know now, 28th of June 1914 is when this event that um, will eventually reverberate around the world, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand takes place. And what basically happens is Archduke Franz Ferdinand arrives in 1914, June 28th, in um, Sarajevo, basically as a friend to the, the Bosnians. He sees himself as being a um, a, a kind of ally of this part of the Austrian-Hungarian um, Empire. He is basically going to see military manoeuvres. It was his wedding anniversary. This was his kind of holiday, if you like, um, away from um, Vienna. He goes with his wife and um, there are crowds out cheering and celebrating this royal couple's arrival in the city. But there are also Serbian um, fighters, Serbian um, patriots who want greater um, control over parts of the Balkan regions where there are Serbs living. So there are, within Serbia, a movement known as Greatest, Greater Serbia who wants to see the expansion of the Serb nation. So those people who were in the crowd um, intent on assassinating Franz Ferdinand will become, to some extent, the, the culprits who we associate with um, those who instigate what will eventually become this key event in the outbreak of World War I. So these people are first of all um, Kabrinovich. Kabrinovic is the first individual who tries to throw a bomb at Franz Ferdinand's entourage. 
um, at Commercial Bridge, uh, next to number two here. And uh, that Commercial Bridge, um, basically, Kabrinovich doesn't do a very good job of trying to assassinate the Archduke. The bomb bounces off the car, and then the car speeds away. <coughs> and Archduke Franz Ferdinand um, makes his way all the way over here to the town hall. And at the town hall, they also discuss what has just happened, and you know they're a bit shaken for obvious reasons. They plan to go and visit the people who actually had been hurt when this bomb had been thrown. So they're going to do do their bit to show that they are um, concerned for local um, Sarajevans who have been injured by this bomb. But the route has to be changed for security reasons. So the driver is told to take a different route. The driver, however, does not remember to change the route. And instead of um, going um, straight down this orange dotted line, he takes a sharp right up Franz Joseph Street. And it is here that Gavrilo Princip, another member of this organisation from Serbia, this organisation was known as the Black Hand Organisation, who um, favoured a greater Serbia. Princip was in a sandwich shop of all places. He sees the car unexpectedly come down the street and he quickly runs from the shop and fires shots at the car. He did not intentionally try and kill the Archduke's wife Sophie. He was mainly aiming for the Archduke and an army general. But he hits the Archduke and Sophie and they die. They die that evening. This therefore is a fairly um, remarkable event because here is uh, next in line to the throne being uh, murdered by um, um, terrorists or freedom fighters um, on the, the streets of a, a major city in uh, South and Eastern Europe. So, what would be the consequences of this event? Well, the Austrians are offended, naturally, by this and they blame the Serbs, they blame the Serbian government, even though there's no real evidence at this point that the Serbian government has anything to do with this assassination, there is um, a position taken in Austria that it was clearly um, the Serbian government who funded, or the Serbian military, who funded these young, idealistic um, um, Serbs who come in and carry out this attack on um, the Archduke. Austria would quite like to punish the Serbs. And the best way to punish the Serbs would be to basically invade them, teach them a lesson, and that would be the end of it. It would be good for Austrian morale, it would be good for the Austrians to uh, demonstrate that they are still a major power and that they can um, defeat a growing power like Serbia. However, Austria, for obvious reasons, has to act cautiously and that obvious reason is because of the pre-existing alliance system that is already in place and you are aware of what this alliance system is because we spoke about it in the German foreign policy um, class in great detail. So, what really is the main concern of the Austrians? Well, the main concern is Russia. What about Russia? If Serbia are punished by the Austrians, will the Russians intervene? So that is what the Serbs are conscious of. There are some Serb... Uh, that's what the Austrians are conscious of, sorry. There are some members of the Austrian government who are really keen on war. The Emperor of Austria-Hungary, um, uh, Franz Joseph, he is not so keen on war. But he's been pressured by the military that you know now is the time to punish Serbia because you know Serbia have tried on previous occasions to um, assassinate. In fact, Franz Josef himself was the um, the target of a Serbian assassination attempt. And the military are saying, look, now you have to punish this this power before they do something much more serious before they try and take Austrian territory. So, just to I guess provide a guarantee that if Russia did get involved. Austria had the support of their ally, an uh, envoy, Count Hoyosh, is sent to Berlin to discuss whether or not Germany would back Austria in a war with Serbia. Not the war with Russia, but uh, a war with Serbia. Now the Kaiser is the person that Count Hoyosh meets um, initially, and the Kaiser is quite happy to state that he gives his support to Austria 
if they decide to go to war with Serbia. Now the blank check source is a source that you have to examine in your assessment, right? This is a, a mandatory source. There is a version of this in the course booklet and there's also a version of the blank check source um, on the My City page where it says the July crisis. But here's a little summary of it here. And these are to some extent the key words from the blank check where the Kaiser um, tells his Chancellor, Bethlen Volweg, to write up a response that can be then sent back to Emperor uh, Franz Joseph in Vienna. And what Bethlen Volweg writes, what the Kaiser has agreed to basically is, um, finally, as far as concerns Serbia, His Majesty, so that's the Kaiser, cannot interfere in the dispute now going on between Austria-Hungary and Serbia, as it is uh, a matter not within his competence. We say, look, you just have to make the decision here, However, and this is the bit that's in bold, the Emperor Francis, Francis uh, Joseph may, however, rest assured that His Majesty, the Kaiser, will faithfully stand by Austria-Hungary, as is required by the obligations of his alliance and of his ancient friendship. Here is the guarantee of German support if Austria goes to war with Serbia, and if the Austrians need assistance, Germany is willing to, to provide that assistance. Okay, so this alliance that had been in place since the 1870s um, uh, is now, to some extent, going to be tested. This is good news for the Serbs. It's known as a blank check because, to some extent, it's a blank check given from the Germans to the Austrians to do as they please. I guess, to some extent, the Austrians should act responsibly with that check and not just write on it whatever they wish. Now, historians who blame Germany for war during the July crisis argue that the blank check is the evidence that can be used to blame the Germans because Germany knew the ramifications of giving such a um, um, kind of guarantee to the Austrians. The ramifications could be what if Russia feel they have to protect Serbia? Then you've got the chance of war escalating. Did the blank check, or was the blank check, an opportunity for Germany to go to war? We know that she had a desire to expand her territory. We know that she was building a navy. We know that Germany was, to some extent, appearing to prepare for a war. We know that Weltpolitik was her ultimate aim. We know that she had involved herself in many diplomatic issues that were really nothing to, to do with herself. Was this now Germany and the Kaiser and Beth and Hovec saying here is an opportunity for war? Those who blame Germany say yes, other historians say no it's not. All that the Kaiser and Beth and Hovec were doing, with the backing of the German military, was um, allowing for Austria to punish Serbia. And therefore what the Kaiser is really thinking about here, what Beth and Hovec is really thinking about here, is not a world war, not a European war, but a local war, and that local war was between Austria-Hungary and Serbia. The Germans could not afford their only ally to lose face, and they could not afford their only ally perhaps to um, be defeated by Serbia now or in the future. So, to some extent, the Kaiser has got little choice but to give this support, otherwise they would be completely um, alienated and isolated. The Germans are to some extent shackled to the Austrians. Even though Germany is the dominant power, even though Germany is um, the power that the Austrians need, the Germans are kind of shackled to a, um, a, a rather indecisive um, country. They are not the best ally Austria-Hungary, but it's all that the Germans have got. Now, that's quite early on in the July crisis, right? That's the 5th and 6th of, um, of, of July. Austria does not issue an ultimatum to Serbia until the 23rd of July. Now, we will look at a little summary of this in a second, but how do we explain the dates? How do we explain this kind of um, lull in proceedings? Well, there's two main reasons. One is that the Austrian-Hungarian Empire is a very complex empire, and the other name in the empire, the Hungary part, had, um, you know, some... Um, opportunity to voice their concerns about a war. The Prime Minister of Hungary, um, Count Tisu, was worried that if there was a war and the Serbs were able to, you know, 
inflict damage on Austria-Hungary, then it might actually lead to the ultimate um, dissolution of the Habsburg Empire. And Hungary had lots of different ethnic minority groups within um, uh, that part of the empire. And the Austrian, uh, sorry, the Hungarian Prime Minister was, was not keen on um, maybe wars taking place within Hungary at the same time as wars were taking place between Serbia and the overall Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So Count Tiso really puts a break on things. In fact, Count Tiso is the one who says, we need to give Serbia an ultimatum. Now the, the hawks in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire government, especially the military, they just want war right away. And to some extent, the Germans would probably want war right away just to get this over and done with. Which might suggest that the Germans are not thinking about a wider war. The other reason as to why the ultimatum to Serbia um, is delayed is because on the 20th of July, the French President Raymond Poincaré was visiting St. Petersburg in Russia on a state visit. And there was a concern that if this was set out, let's say, on the 18th or the 19th of um, July, then the Russians uh, and the French could get together in Russia and formulate a concerted um, and kind of united response to this, um, this ultimatum. Now the question is, what does Serbia think about the ultimatum? Um, there is a full text of the ultimatum in the My City page on the July crisis, but here's a little summary of it, just so you know. Serbia must end all anti-Austrian agitation. This went even as far as the Austrian school system were basically told you can't, you can't be anti-Austrian in anything that you write. Um, number two, they must punish any Serbian official involved in the Muggle France Ferdinand. And number three, this was the one issue that really um, denied the, the, the chances of this ultimatum being accepted by the Serbs. The Austrians must be allowed to join the investigation into who was responsible for this um, assassination in Serbia. So i.e. Austrian police in Serbia. And the Serbs refused that that would be an infringement of their sovereignty. So Austria now has the opportunity to declare war, which is what the Hawks and the Austrian army wanted. Count Tizu um, kind of loses out here as a result of um, the Serbian rejection. To be honest, it was highly unlikely that they would um, accept it. Um, and the British uh, Foreign Secretary, Edward Grey, he thought this was an incredibly tough um, and very severe um, ultimatum. There are some historians who have speculated that maybe Germany and the German military, led by General uh, General von Moltke, was pushing the the Austrians further, make, make this a more severe um, ultimatum, in the hope that Serbia would uh, reject it, and then maybe Germany could get involved in a war that some German generals had wanted for a long, a long time, that Weltpolitik could eventually um, get under underway by force because it hadn't been achieved through other um, means at this point. This does lead, a question, lead us to another question. Who really is making decisions within Germany at this point? Is it the Kaiser? Is it Beth Hovig? Is it the military? The Austrians themselves weren't so sure. Um, and this point is, is raised in the, the video that you're going to watch where the historians are discussing the blank check and they do raise this question. Who rules in Germany? There is definitely confusion in the summer of 1914. So on the 20th of July, Austria-Hungary declare war on Serbia. They fire shells over the border into um, Serbia. And um, once this Austrian declaration of war is made formal, then all of a sudden Russia enters the picture. Russia had her problems at this point domestic problems, revolution in 1905, industrial unrest, minor strikes in 1912, they had just been defeated um, in the early part of the 20th century in a battle uh, with the Japanese. So things were not looking good for, for, for Russia and the Tsar and for the Russian military. Now what had kind of happened in 1913, early 1914 within Russia in an attempt to overcome some of these domestic problems, the Russian government really emphasised the importance of pan-Slavism, that is that Russians were really the fathers or the big brother of all these smaller Slavonic nations. And what you get is a kind of increase in nationalism within Russia that might have united the country, and this nationalism was really linked to the idea that Russia 
uh, we're still a powerful nation that could protect other similar Slavonic people in, in parts of um, Europe, primarily in the Balkan um, region. So will Russia perhaps act in a more antagonistic way to Austria in regards to Serbia? The Kaiser didn't think that Russia would. The Kaiser felt, how can the Russian Tsar protest against the assassination of um, one of the kind of um, European monarchs um, or next in line to the throne in, in Austria-Hungary it would look bizarre if the Kaiser um, as if the Tsar had kind of accepted that so the Kaiser is kind of confident that Russia would not get involved but Russia right away starts to um, make comments about how she is a protector of the Slavs and of the Serbs therefore as the rest of this New York Times article says was the peace of Europe now in the hands of the Kaiser because only the Kaiser could influence Austria and if Austria could be influenced if Austria were told to stop stop this war then that would stop any Russian threat of mobilisation although the Russia, Russian army started to mobilise quite quickly because of the vast scale and size of the Russian army you had to do it over a series of weeks so the Kaiser's hands would he be able to stop any um, conflict. This leads us to the relationship between the Kaiser, Wilhelm II and Tsar Nicholas II, the Tsar or Kaiser Emperor of Russia. During the um, weeks really or the week before war breaks out, um, for all um, major powers, there were telegrams sent back and forth between um, William and Nicholas, right? And these telegrams are eventually known as the Willy Nicky telegrams. And there is a source um, that you must use in your um, assessment. So this is a second mandatory source, and these are known as the Willy Nicky telegrams. They are available in my city and they're available in the coastal clip. They may point to both Russia and Germany being responsible for the war, but maybe even more so Russia to blame for the war than Germany. So this is where you get the um, conflicting arguments. Blank check, maybe argues that Germany were to blame, Willy Nicky telegrams, maybe argues that, that Russia uh, were to blame. And therefore, if you have been asked this question, you know, where, where Germany primarily responsible for the outbreak of the war, well, the answer to that would be maybe not, because what about the actions of other powers, such as the Russians? What was the content of the Willy Nicky telegrams? Well, they start off um, you know, fairly nicely and um, they start off in the latter part of um, July but as we get closer and closer to August um, they, are, they are kind of less courteous if you like um, so this is um, maybe evidence that Russia are responsible for what was going on now remember did Russia really have to get involved in the, 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 the crisis over um, Franz Ferdinand if Austria declared war on Serbia, did the Russians really have to mobilise their forces? Always bear that in mind when we think about blaming the Germans. So here is the first um, telegram. Kaiser to the Tsar, July 30th. I say the first, there had been other ones. This is, I mean the first one we're going to examine. Um, you can read the earlier ones in your own time because as I said, they're on my city. Um, so what we get in this little telegram here is that the, the Kaiser um, is trying to make clear that the Russian desire to mobilise an army is, 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 a bad, is a bad move. So um, in the third line down, um, the Kaiser draws attention, or tries to draw the Tsar's attention to the fact that it's a very dangerous, uh, with grave consequences, um, dangerous move to um, mobilise the army. And um, what basically um, the Kaiser says, he says, Austria has only mobilised against Serbia and only a part of her army. And Austria were entitled to do that because you know, their next in line the throne had been killed, even if there wasn't clear evidence that Serbia, uh, the Serbian government were involved. There was enough evidence to suggest that there must have been some link between the Serbian government or military to the assassins. So the Kaiser then goes on to say, if, as it is now the case, according to the communication by you and your government, that's the Russian government, Russia mobilizes against Austria, my role as mediator that you kindly entrusted with me and which I accepted will be endangered if not ruined. So in the previous telegrams in the previous days, the Kaiser emphasized on a couple of occasions that he was trying to bring 
some type of resolution to the Austrian Serbian conflict. The Kaiser said, look, I, I can't I can't not let this, the, the Austrians do something because they have been wronged by Serbia. But the Kaiser looks like he's trying to keep this as a local war. Now, if he's trying to be a mediator, a negotiator, as he states, then it would give the impression that Germany is not looking to go to war in 1914. That, in spite of the blank check, the Kaiser, as maybe a representative of the German state, is saying, look, we, we don't want war. We only want a local war, punish Serbia, and then so be it. The Kaiser finishes by saying, the whole weight of the decision lies solely on your shoulders, i.e. the Tsar's shoulders. He's the man who's got to decide whether it's peace or, or voice. Kaisers can say, this has got nothing to do with you, don't, don't get involved. Russia has not been offended in any way by the um, invasion of Serbia by Austria. Um, and then the Tsar gets back to the Kaiser, following day, I thank you heartily for your mediation. And then he says, it's technically impossible to stop our military preparations. So he says, look, once we've started, it's hard for us to, to stop them, right? Because we have such a large army um, that has to kind of come from quite far distances to uh, prepare itself for, for war. And he says, um, so it's hard for us to stop our military preparations, which were obligatory owing to Austria's mobilization. Now, Austria did, Austria did mobilize. They didn't mobilize with the intention of invading Russia. They mobilized with the intention, obviously, of invading Serbia. The, the Tsar then says, we are far from wishing war as long as the negotiations with Austria on Serbia's account are taking place, my troops shall not make any provocative action. I give you my solemn word for this. Well, that was not enough for the Kaiser. The Kaiser felt once you had mobilised your army, and some of that mobilisation was along the border between Russia and Germany, not just between Russia and Austria-Hungary, then the Kaiser started to take the view that, wait a minute, Russians can't be trusted here. I'm doing my best to negotiate, and they're mobilising their army. But you could take those words where the Tsar says, I give you my solemn word that he still wanted successful mediation. Mediation between Austria and Serbia. So make of the Willie Nicky telegrams what you wish, but you should use them in your essay to support the view that Germany alone are not to blame. Other countries have to take some responsibility for the outbreak of war during the July crisis. So what happens next? Well, the Germans decide that if you can't trust the Russians, you have to begin your own plans for war, and they do. They uh, declare war on Russia, and um, this brings France into the equation for the first time, and the French think, well, do you know what? We have an alliance with Russia. We should mobilise um, our army, just in case. Um, this is a slightly blurry uh, newspaper from America, but um, from um, the Greensboro Daily News, where it says, Germany formally declares war against Russia, Great Britain and France drawn into the vortex. So Britain and France, as a result of the Triple Entente, which again was kind of formally finalised by 1907, all of a sudden these two countries have to take, it, take into account how they should react to a Russian um, war with both, um, eventually Austria-Hungary, but initially with Germany. The German military is planning, therefore, to um, not just go to war with Russia, but go to war with France, because she knows deep down that the French will defend the Russians. So German troops invade Luxembourg. Many people think the beginning of the war really is the invasion of Belgium, but it's not. It starts off with an invasion of Luxembourg on the 2nd of August, and this is part of the deployment plan for the German army, part of what we eventually call the Schlieffen um, plan, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and Germany issues an ultimatum to Belgium, so she says to the Belgians, um, look, if you can allow us to pass through your territory, we will do so without causing any damage, we won't we'll kind of treat you as a neutral nation, but the the Belgians are, are, are not so keen on that, and they know, the Belgians know they have the support of the British from an ancient treaty, or not an ancient treaty, but a treaty from the previous century. So the Belgians might not be overly keen um, on... Um, German troops marching through and um, what therefore happens is the German troops just say well if you're not going to give us permission we will invade anyway and um, as we do so we are going to declare war on the French because also the invasion of Belgium meant the invasion of um, France and this invasion was part of what had been planned from 1905 under um, what was known as the Schlieffen Plan the former um, German 
Army General Alfred von Schlieffen had come up with this plan of attack where the German forces would invade France via Belgium and Luxembourg, defeat France as quickly as possible, most likely within six weeks, turn the troops around and march all the way to Russia where a longer war would take place against a, a much larger um, army um, along a much larger um, front, the Eastern Front. So that was a, that was a plan. Um, the Schlieffen plan, it did not work, but we'll come back to that when we look at World War One in a few months. 4th of August, Britain didn't have to get involved in the war, but she does get involved in the war. She gives the excuse that she's going to war to protect Belgium. Some historians might accept that, others are much more sceptical. Britain went to war because she was fearful of a German victory. A German victory could be an ultimate threat to the British Empire. Strong Germany in Europe that defeats maybe France, that defeats Russia, could be therefore um, a power just too too large for the British to deal with. Therefore Britain would have to give concessions to Germany and that would jeopardise parts of the British Empire. So Britain declares war in Germany. There's examples of the um, British press. Um, declaring that you know attempts by the British to find a negotiated way out of this had kind of failed and um, yeah Britain is at war and then finally um, even though these two countries are kind of responsible for it all um, Austria-Hungary declares war on Russia on the 6th of August they don't even back the German their German allies uh, right away they wait another five days before they um, declare war on Russia but we have then two camps at war we've got the uh, dual alliance of Austria-Hungary and Germany against the Triple Entente of Russia, France and um, Britain. And that's where we're going to leave things because there's a video that you can watch now. Um, I'm not going to play this video right now because you don't want to watch a video within a video. So you will go to the July Crisis My City page and, and watch this video on the um, July Crisis. It's a British made documentary narrated by Max Hastings called The Necessary War. And the position taken within this documentary is very much one that the Germans were to blame, which to some extent kind of contrasts with what I was saying regarding the, the Willie Nicky telegrams. Okay, thank you very much.